It's the Real News Network. I'm Sharmini Pires coming to you from Baltimore. After making significant gains in the local council elections on May 3rd, the British Labour Party has published a new economic platform. The Labour Party is almost unrecognizable these days when it comes to the way in which it is talking about the economy compared to what it was like just a few years ago. Now, the new economic platform is very detailed and it contains plans to reform the tax system and financial systems, increase investment in infrastructure and in sustainable energy and housing. Now, on to talk about all of this with me is John Weeks. He is Professor Emeritus of the University of London School of Oriental and African Studies and the author of Economics of the 1%, How Mainstream Economics Serves the Rich, Obscure Reality and Distorts Policy. John, I thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. Let me say it's very important that the uh, Real News is interviewing me because it's extremely difficult to have a discussion of economic policy, of labor's economic policy in, in Britain because the forces that are opposed to uh, progressive policies want all the discussed diversionary issues such as um, uh, Brexit and um, Jeremy Corbyn's alleged uh, uh, anti-Jewish anti views and that he's really a Russian agent and all of those things. And so it's a great relief to actually be able to talk about Labour's economic policy. And you have a lot of watchers in London, so this is quite important. John, let's start off with the Labour Party's approach to uh, developing a new economic plan for the party and the kind of exercises it is engaged in in doing that. All right, well, I think that, as I suspect most of your viewers know, the Labour Party uh, has changed dramatically since uh, Jeremy Corbyn became the leader. It is now a social democratic party again, or at least the leadership is. The, uh, uh, there's quite a split among the members of parliament, but we don't necessarily have to go into that unless it's relevant. And there's been widespread consultation by uh, in Labour Party, local constituency parties, and through the organization uh, Momentum, which you had uh, John Landsman on, I think, recently, and he is, of course, uh, the, the, uh, one of the leaders of Momentum. So there's been widespread consultation. I don't want to be romantic and say, you know, it's all bottom up, but the leadership has made a sincere and, I would say, extensive attempt to present their policies to a very large uh, uh, number of people and to get reactions to those policies. And that is, I would say, unprecedented, or at least over the last 20 or 30 years. Now, give us an example of that, John. You were just citing to me offline that just this weekend, uh, there was a fairly large uh, uh, conference that took place in terms of this sort of consultation that's underway. Yes, um, uh, this, uh, uh, on Saturday, uh, at one of the London colleges, there was uh, Labour's State of the Economy conference. Conference. There have been several of these, uh, and Jeremy Corbyn spoke at the beginning, and uh, John McDonald spoke at the end. There were about 800 people there. But most impressive was the wide range of uh, panels and uh, plenary speakers that range from very uh, committed uh, feminists and uh, 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 gay and lesbian uh, representatives, sort of a people talking about um, uh, fiscal policy in a, in a quite um, uh, a narrow sense about things like budget and uh, how, whether or not the def how large the deficit should, should be, how big the uh, national debt should be, uh, uh, monetary policy. So there was quite an um, interaction uh, with the audience. Uh, I was at a session in which um, a new organization was uh, launched, which I'm coordinating, called Progressive Economy Forum. We had about 80 people, and there was an, an exchange and arguments over what policies should be implemented. So it's quite an exciting time. 
Uh, they would be, be more exciting if we actually were in government, but uh, that day will come. John, it was no secret that Jeremy Corbyn didn't support the move for a Brexit uh, to leave the European Union. Um, yet, once the people in Britain voted uh, for the Brexit, and uh, the Labour Party has been grappling with this issue of how to respond to it. But in this economic platform, it really clearly takes a position on Brexit, um, stating that uh, Labour accepts the referendum and, uh, and that Labour government will put the national interest of the uh, country first. Um, what does this mean? And does it mean that Labour will uh, give up uh, on the issue of remaining in the EU? Well, I think there, there are two big um, uh, issues here. One is um, if a British government, whatever it was, Labour Conservative, if the British government wanted to remain in the European Union, could it do so? That's the question, first question. And then what is the position of the Labour Party? All right. <clears throat> the answer to the first question, I think, is no. That um, the British government, um, the, the current Conservative government, has taken a number of absolutely uh, definitive steps, which have never been taken before by any member of the European Union, to leave the European Union. They held a referendum, which was uh, then won by the people who wanted to leave the European Union. Uh, I supported remaining in the uh, European Union, uh, and, and I still do, though I think it is no longer possible to do so. In fact, I was on the real news several years ago, uh, speaking in favor of, of staying in the European Union. So first there was a referendum. Then the government passed legislation announcing its intention to leave within two years that are related to a particular provision of the uh, European Union's treaties. The Labour Party supported that legislation and now the deadline will come just over, well, actually just under a year from now. Would it be possible to reverse that? Could a labor government come in, let's say, if we have a, a labor government within, uh, uh, before that, the, the two years run out? I very much hope we do. Uh, and it came in and said, well, actually, we've changed our mind. Uh, we're going to repeal that legislation and we're going to go back to the original position we had before the referendum, because the referendum was only advisory. I suspect the response of the European Union leaders would be to say, no, that Britain has to reapply. They might facilitate Britain reapplying but the implication of Britain reapplying is that it would lose certain key advantages or opt-outs, they're called, which it had, which conservative and labor governments had negotiated. And those opt-outs, the most important of them is the opt-out to join the, Euro, the, the European currency. So if Britain came back in, if it were readmitted, if it reapplied, then it would have to commit to join the euro. Now, the importance of that, and forgive me for going on for a while, is it would be almost impossible to sell that to the British people. If a conservative government or a Labour government were to say, we are going, we're staying in the European Union and we are going to join the euro, that government would certainly fall. And so it would be very difficult to remain in the European Union as a practical matter. The practical implication of the arguments over the European Union, and this is shown in the really only 
center-left uh, newspaper, The Guardian, which is very pro-European uh, Union, the implication of that is to try to weaken Corbyn's leadership. That is the practical consequence of it. I say that as someone who would like to stay in the European Union, but the, whether or not Britain can stay in the European Union, I would say now is, as Jeremy Corbyn said, the train has left. Maybe something could have been done a year ago, so nothing can be done now. Britain will leave the European Union. The question is under what conditions. But it is a very powerful club to beat the Labour leadership with. All right. Um, now, there are many other features in this uh, economic program. It tries to tackle uh, issues, big issues like education, um, of course, the, uh, the NHS program, the National Health Program. And in fact, uh, in this platform, they're talking about having a national education uh, uh, system which is similar to the NHS in terms of how it might be administered. Um, can you talk a little bit more about what else is on that platform which includes the uh, education sector and why you feel that uh, the British education system needs fixing uh, according to Labour? The British system has a, um, of course, as in the United States, it has um, uh, uh, publicly funded schools, state funded schools, and it has privately funded schools. And then in addition, the uh, conservatives, the Tory party, Tory leadership, wants to return to an, a system which was largely abolished about uh, 20 years ago, in which within the state system, there was a hierarchy. And so there was sort of an elitist stream, which were called grammar schools, uh, and then there were uh, for the uh, schools for everybody else, which were called secondary modern. In effect, the grammar schools were, were the equivalent of privately funded schools within the public sector that were uh, uh, funded by, by the state. The Labour Party will eliminate the hierarchy within the uh, uh, public sector and will put the, the funding on a, let's say, sustainable basis. The current system is, I think people in the U.S. can uh, imagine this because they're going through the same thing. Many communities, underfunding of schooling and you know, sh shortages of teachers, uh, uh, buildings deteriorating, uh, in inadequate uh, uh, teaching equipment and a lack of modernization, uh, inadequate number of computers and things such as that. And the Labour Party, by having a national education system, like a national health system, will remedy that. It won't be done immediately, but I think it could be done in the life of a, of a five-year Labour government. John, Grenfell Tower is still vivid in many people's uh, memory where the tower was burning and the issue of housing was highlighted not only in the UK but the world over, the issues that poor people have in terms of housing. Now, the housing crisis in Britain is something that the Labour government is promising to address by building over a million new homes. Uh, tell us about those uh, programs or plans underway. Well, I think um, Grenville Tower event was it was a national scandal, continues to be a national uh, national scandal. Uh, it involved a tower block, uh, a high-rise apartment block, which had um, um, what's it called cladding on the outside, it had a covering on the outside, uh, which was flammable. And a very large number of people were killed in that building. Uh, you know, Americans who have seen the um, um, images of people leaping from the Twin Towers, uh, uh, you know, 9-11, uh, 
well, um, you have a good idea of what, uh, what happened. That highlighted a national problem which has been around for a long time, a shortage of housing. This shortage of housing is a result of conservative governments not building affordable housing. So as a result, you have had a housing market, particularly in cities, particularly in London, but in other cities also, and which has become increasingly unaffordable and people living in extremely crowded circumstances Labor will solve that problem in several ways. One, of course, they were committed to building housing, but if the, the issue is what will be the institutional form that that housing will take. Uh, and increasingly, the policy is that it will be what's called council housing. And what that means is that it will be rental accommodation owned by the state with affordable rents and in which people can live and not um, go into poverty as a result of the exorbitant housing costs. How will the housing be financed? How will construction costs? We're talking about a very large um, uh, financial commitment. Uh, this will be done through a public sector investment bank, which is part of the labor program, as you probably know. And that public sector investment bank uh, will be properly funded and will build out and will finance housing all over the United Kingdom and will finance it through the local government. So this is not just a question of contracting private uh, companies uh, uh, to build housing, which has pretty much been what little the Tories have built is what they've done. But this will mean having local governments organize, locate, arrange the design of this housing, and then contract people to build it. All right, um, there is quite a bit for us to discuss, John. Um, let's let's go into this whole issue of finance now. Finance um, and how the state regulates finance in the country has become a major issue uh, in in all of the world, in the U.S. and U.K. alike. Um, what are the plans to reform the financial system and regulate it? Well, this is an area where uh, I was meeting today with the shadow chancellor of the exchequer. That would be the equivalent of the U.S. of uh, a uh, the uh, chancellor of the exchequer is like secretary of the treasury. And in Britain, you have the system where the opposition party has a uh, parallel person that corresponds to every ministerial or departmental post. And the uh, shadow chancellor of the, uh, the exchequer in Britain is a man named John McDonald. Uh, banking is something which he has given extreme high priority to uh, throughout his uh, career in uh, parliament. And so he's very concerned about it. Having said that, this is a potentially very dangerous territory for the Labour Party. Because, of course, the mainstream press is just waiting for John to say something about, you know, how they're going to regulate financial markets. And then he will be attacked as a dangerous socialist, uh, a, a Marxist, uh, someone who is... Uh, too irresponsible to um, serve as chancellor. <clears throat> All right, what have they said they're going to do and what will they do? First, they will regulate the financial sector. Initially, this will be done through uh, several concrete 
uh, mechanisms. One will be very much tightening the accounting practices of the financial sector and monitoring financial capital's uh, accounts, you might say, in a much uh, tighter way. Uh, second, it will be through using the Bank of England uh, as a much more as a regulator uh, of financial markets. And I think uh, being considered, or I would recommend uh, be considered, actual types of financial regulation, such as limiting uh, speculation. Uh, I'll, I'll give a concrete, a, a simple um, uh, uh, policy, which has uh, been suggested, which has not formally been accepted by the Labour Party, but one that is being discussed, is that there would be, if you buy a stock or a bond, you hold, uh, unless you hold it for a certain period, you'll be taxed when you sell it. For example, if you if you if you buy a stock or a bond, you sell it within six months. There will be a tax on that. That is to dis that is the type of policy which is employed in a number of countries, uh, famously in Chile, uh, but uh, it would reduce the extent of uh, uh, speculation. Having said that, uh, financial markets are very, very powerful, and uh, some um, bold steps uh, um, uh, must be taken. Uh, the Labour Party is uh, uh, con considering them, and I think, um, could there be, for example, a run on the pound if a, uh, the, a Labour government were elected? I think it's quite possible. What can you do to prevent that? Uh, I think the answer to that is that there are certain types of capital regulations need to be seriously uh, considered as uh, short-term uh, measures. And uh, the, uh, they're, while they're not specified in the um, um, manifesto, uh, there is a clear commitment there to taming uh, financial uh, markets. All right, John, there's so much more to discuss with you, including uh, the plans of the Labour Party as far as uh, the military sector is concerned, around spending, around buying new equipment and so on. But let's leave that for another day, and we'll uh, look forward to having you back. I thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you very much for having me, and thank all the uh listeners uh, for uh, uh for tuning in and uh, it's always a pleasure to be on the real news network thank you john it's a pleasure to have you and i thank all of you out there listening to the real news as well and uh please join us again